Hello everybody, today we're going to talk about the essential biomolecules that you need to know for the USMLE Step 1. So why is this relevant? Well, it is important to be familiar with all types of molecules you will encounter in USMLE Step 1. Familiarity with these molecules and their basic characteristics will help you understand other important Step 1 topics such as biochemistry, cell biology, genetics, pharmacology, metabolism, physiology, and laboratory technique. The metabolism of these molecules is also extremely important for USMLE Step 1. In this lecture, we will introduce all types of biomolecules you will encounter in USMLE Step 1 and briefly describe their function and relevant metabolism. We're going to talk about carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, vitamins, and metabolites. But before we start going into details, it is important th to discuss the general configurations that biomolecules may take. All biomolecules are made up of smaller basic molecules called monomers. Any molecule made up of more than one monomer is a polymer. Most of the essential biomolecules are made up of elementary monomers. For example, carbohydrates are made up of monosaccharide monomers, and depending on the type and configuration of these monomers, you get different carbohydrate polymers, such as glycogen or cellulose. Proteins are made up of amino acid monomers, and nucleic acids are made up of nucleotide monomers. We'll talk about all these in the coming slides. The human body, as well as all living things, are constantly converting biomolecules into different biomolecules via a series of chemical reactions called metabolism. These reactions are essential for maintaining life. And biochemistry is essentially the study of the chemical reactions required to maintain life. So with that in mind, let's get started. We will start our discussion of biomolecules with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are molecules which are made up of carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen atoms. There are hundreds of different carbohydrates. However, the types which are relevant for step one are glucose, fructose, sucrose, ribose, and glycogen. Glucose is the most abundant carbohydrate monomer in the human body, and is also its primary source of energy. Fructose is another carbohydrate monomer. It is found in foods such as fruits and plants. Galactose is another type of carbohydrate monomer, which is commonly found in foods such as dairy and plants. Sucrose, on the other hand, is a disaccharide, which means it is a small polymer made up of a glucose and a fructose monomer. It is also found in plants. Ribose is found in nucleic acids such as RNA and DNA. It also is a carbohydrate monomer. However, it's a little bit different than the other typical carbohydrate monomers. We will talk more about these in later videos. Glycogen, on the other hand, is the storage form of glucose. It is made up by combining a lot of glucose monomers to form a long chain. It is produced by the human body in tissues such as the liver and skeletal muscle. Carbohydrate metabolism overall is a very complex and important topic of biochemistry. We will discuss the, follow the following biochemical reactions in later lectures. These include glycolysis, gluconeogenesis, glycogenesis, glycogenolysis, and the pentose phosphate pathway. Next, we will talk about proteins. Proteins are large and complex polymers made up of amino acid monomers. Proteins are the central molecules of life and perform almost all of the processes required to sustain life. Proteins can perform an abundance of different tasks such as catalyzing chemical reactions as in enzymes, maintaining the structure of cells as in cytoskeletal proteins, or participate in fighting infection, as in antibodies. All the possible functions of proteins are determined by its three-dimensional configuration. A protein's three-dimensional configuration, in turn, is ultimately determined by its amino acid sequence. The chemical interactions between the atoms of the protein's amino acid allow the protein to fold and develop its intended shape, and therefore function. There are four different mechanisms by which proteins can achieve a specific three-dimensional configuration. Each one of these configurations is dominated by a different kind of chemical interaction. We will talk about these on the next slide. Given that most reactions involved in maintaining life require proteins, the process of making functional proteins is extremely important. Because proteins are basically made from instructions stored in parts of DNA called genes, the process of making proteins is also called gene expression. So as we said before, the three-dimensional configuration of a protein determines its function. This is extremely important. And there are four different ways that a protein can achieve its intended three-dimensional configuration. Each one of these is governed by a specific type of chemical interaction. And you need to know these. So we will start with primary structure. Primary structure simply refers to the sequence of amino acids, nothing more. Secondary structure refers to physical configurations that occur due to hydrogen bonds between amino acids. There are two types of secondary structure, alpha helices and beta-plated sheets. So 
as you can see, we have an alpha helix right here. It kind of looks like DNA. Now, alpha helices are commonly found in proteins that bind DNA and transmembrane proteins. The other type of secondary structure is a beta plated sheet. Beta plated sheets are commonly found in proteins believed to be responsible for Alzheimer's and amyloidosis. Now, what I want you to remember for secondary structure is that both of these structures are secondary structures because they are governed by a type of chemical interaction called a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is a chemical interaction that occurs between atoms such as nitrogen and oxygen. So for example, in this beta plated sheet, we can see that there are hydrogen bonds between oxygen and the nitrogen. The next type of protein structure is tertiary structure. Tertiary structure refers to the physical configurations that occur due to interactions between the side chains of amino acids. So as we will soon learn, amino acids have side chains. And each of these side chains have atoms, and these atoms can interact with other atoms in other amino acids. And this is the basis of tertiary structure. An example of tertiary structure would be a disulfide bond. So we can imagine that we would have a disulfide bond right here, another one here, maybe even another one here. So the important thing to know here is that a tertiary structure occurs due to interactions between the side chains of amino acids. The last type of protein structure is quaternary structure. Now, quaternary structure refers to the physical configuration that occur when you have more than one protein, such as in a protein complex. So, for example, the hemoglobin structure, which is made up of smaller proteins called beta and alpha globins, is an example of a quaternary structure. Over here, I drew a quaternary structure. In this case, you have two proteins that are working together to form a bigger group of proteins. This is quaternary structure. As mentioned before, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, and the chemical interactions between the atoms of each amino acid determines the three-dimensional configuration of a protein, and therefore its function. There are a total of 20 different amino acids in the human body, and they all share the same basic structure. That is, they all have an amino group which contains a nitrogen atom, right here, They all have a carboxyl group, which contains a carbon atom with two oxygen atoms. So we can see an example of that right here. And they all have a side chain, which contains various configurations of atoms based on the type of amino acid. That is what distinguishes different amino acid types, the side chains. Amino acids have different chemical properties, such as acidity, charge, and polarity. And depending on the quantity of each of these amino acids in a protein, that protein has its own unique set of chemical properties. Amino acids also have functions beyond serving as the building blocks of proteins. Amino acids can be directly converted to other important biomolecules such as neurotransmitters, hormones, nucleic acids, and other amino acids. Lastly, there are nine essential amino acids that are basically amino acids that the body cannot produce from other biomolecules. These amino acids therefore must be ingested as part of the diet. We will talk about these in later lectures. Next, nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are polymers made up of nucleotide monomers. Nucleotides are not true monomers since they are themselves made up of more elementary molecules. These molecules include a phosphate group, a ribose group, and something called a nitrogenous base. A nitrogenous base is a molecule which has a ring structure made up of many nitrogen atoms. We will see one in a little bit. The most important nucleic acids in the human body are DNA, RNA, NADH, FADH, NADPH, ATP, and GTP. We will talk about these in the upcoming lectures. A unique feature of nucleotides, the building blocks of nucleic acids, is that they have a tendency to form pairs. There are a total of five different nucleotides which vary based on the nitrogenous base on the nucleotide. So for example, we have adenosine, cytosine, thymine, guanine, and uracil. Thymine is not found in RNA. Instead, you have uracil in its place. Here you can see the various kinds of nucleic acids and appreciate how they all have the same basic elements, which are a phosphate group, ribose, sugar, and a nitrogenous base. So over here we have DNA. We, can, we have our phosphate group, our ribose, sugar, and our nitrogenous base. Like we said before, a nitrogenous base is a ring-shaped molecule that contains multiple nitrogen atoms. This would be an example of a cytosine nucleotide. Over here we move on to ATP, a different kind of nucleic acid. As you can see, it also has a phosphate group a ribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. ATP, I'm sorry, NAD+, plus, another type of nucleotide, or nucleic acid, I'm sorry, has a phosphate group, ribose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. In DNA, cytosine pairs with guanine, 
and adenine pairs with thymine via hydrogen bonds. This is the same mechanism seen in the secondary structure of proteins. Nucleotides are also divided into two groups based on what kind of chemical ring the nucleic base has. They can either be purines, as in adenine and guanine, or pyrimidines, as in cytosine, thymine, and uracil. This will become relevant when we discuss DNA mutations and DNA repair mechanisms in later lectures. But really quick, the basic difference between a purine and a pyrimidine is the amount of rings. Purines, such as adenine and guanine, typically have two rings. It's a two-ring system. Over here we have a guanine with their two rings. A pyrimidine, on the other hand, such as this one right here, only has a single ring. And that is basically what determines the difference between pyrimidines and purines. Next, we will talk about lipids. Lipids are defined as molecules which can dissolve in nonpolar solvents or simply substances that are hydrophobic. Lipids are a lot more variable in terms of physical structure than other biomolecules. They can exist as linear or ring-shaped molecules. They can range from only a few atoms to hundreds of atoms and, and can even include many different kinds of atoms. In the human body, lipids function as a source of energy, messenger molecules as in hormones or steroids. They can also function as vitamins or cofactors which are required for some biochemical reactions. And they're also an important component of the plasma membrane of all cells. Below are some of the most important types of lipid metabolism, which we will cover in later lectures. These include fatty acid synthesis, beta oxidation, ketogenesis, the carnitine shuttle system, and cholesterol synthesis. Now let's talk about vitamins. Vitamins are small molecules which are typically not made up of monomers, but rather are elementary molecules themselves. As we said before, the human body is constantly changing biomolecules into different biomolecules through a series of chemical reactions. Some of these reactions cannot occur unless a cofactor is present. A cofactor functions as a tool to help the body perform a necessary biochemical reaction. That's essentially what a vitamin is, a cofactor. Unlike many important biomolecules, the body cannot produce most types of vitamins. Therefore, they must be ingested in the diet, similar to the essential amino acids. If there is a lack of vitamins, certain essential biochemical reactions cannot occur, and this leads to the family of conditions known as the vitamin deficiencies. Lastly, we will talk about metabolites. Metabolites are a general term for any molecule which the body produces as part of its metabolism. Given that most biochemical pathways require multiple steps or intermediate reactions, at any given time there are hundreds if not thousands of metabolites in the body. Many metabolites can be converted to different kinds of biomolecules, not just one. So for example, certain amino acids can be converted into metabolites. These metabolites can be converted into either a different amino acid or glucose, a carbohydrate. It all depends on what the body needs. Lastly, metabolites serve as the principle for many diagnostic tests. Certain drugs are converted into specific metabolites by enzymes in the body. The presence of these metabolites indicates the presence of these drugs. So in summary, the human body is constantly converting biomolecules into different kinds of biomolecules through a series of chemical reactions in order to maintain life. Biochemistry is the study of these chemical reactions. Most biomolecules are made up of monomers, which give the molecules its properties and characteristics. Errors in any of the necessary biochemical reactions can lead to disease or death. Vitamins are essential for helping the body accomplish necessary chemical reactions, and without them you get vitamin deficiencies. So with that, we've covered the major molecules that you're likely to encounter in the basic science questions of USMLE Step 1. See you in the next lecture.